Hello, everyone. I'm here with one of my greatest friends, somebody I love with all my heart and admire with all my heart, Adam Bucko. We've been great buddies for years, co-conspirators of Christ consciousness, CCCC. But we've also been people who have constantly talked about the need for a deeper experience of prayer, a deeper spreading of the great mystical practices at the heart of Christianity. I want to introduce Adam, but I'd much rather that he introduced himself and just told us a little bit about his life and what he's doing now. Because for me, he is a man of prayer and I'm so honored that you've really consented to talk to me about why prayer is so important for you and what prayer can do for people, especially in this time, which you and I both know is a time of a global dark night, a series of overwhelming catastrophes on every level, which are coming together to either annihilate the human race or to compel a huge quiet revolution of love in action because there really isn't now any, any other choice. And in one way, thank God, and in another way, God Almighty, <laughs> as you know. So Adam, speak to us a little bit and tell this audience that is going to get this video on prayer about your journey as far as you can. Uh, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity to, to, to be in a conversation. You've been such a great friend and mentor for for a very long time now and uh, i am really grateful for having you in my life uh, so thank you for that in terms of my my own journey uh, i was born and grew up in poland i was born in 1975 so uh, before uh, the socialist regime before the totalitarian regime collapsed. So a lot of my early years were really about living in that system and trying to figure out how to not lose touch with, with my humanity, really. Um, so when I think about my childhood, you know, uh, early on, I realized that there are really two options that I had. One was to become an alcoholic, which I saw many people doing that. And that was their way of just simply getting numb because the world into which we were born didn't really have many opportunities, didn't have space for our dreams, didn't have space for anything that mattered to us, you know? Um, and so on one hand, you had that, people just kind of going into alcoholism and, and all kinds of other things, oftentimes accompanied by violence, you know, and etc. On the other hand, there was a huge percentage of the population of the country who were becoming activists, uh, who were uh, really trying to articulate uh, the dream that people felt in their hearts, the dream for freedom, the dream for uh, human dignity, the dream for democracy, really, you know. Um, and at that time, uh, Poland was probably 99% Roman Catholic. Uh, and so that meant that a lot of our leaders were priests, uh, priests who really embody uh, this kind of something that to me as a child was very attractive. It was this inner freedom that they had, this ability to say no to the government, mm. this ability to, to, to be able to speak truth to very powerful people, and at the same time, constantly calling people into nonviolence, basically saying that our way is the way of love. So we have to pray for those who persecute us. We have to pray for those who are killing our brothers and sisters. We have to pray for those who tomorrow might show up at our doorsteps and want to imprison us. Gosh. And so, you know, that was being surrounded by that gave me this sense that whatever is happening here 
with all of its abuses and with all of its manipulations and with all of its power games, that there is something much larger, much powerful than that. And that gave me courage to begin to say no in, in, in small little ways as a child, you know, uh, would. Um, being inspired by those priests, I also began to be attracted to this ideal of priesthood. So I have these memories, you know, from my early childhood where I would just build a little altar in my home, uh, wrap myself in some kind of a white blanket and try to say mass, try to imitate what I saw in church, you know. And it wasn't some kind of a longing for power or, you know, clericalism. It was really, I really wanted to get in touch with that something that I felt was present in those men, you know? And so I remember clearly this very first experience that I had that really for me felt like an experience of prayer where I would just stand there with that, you know, by that homemade altar, probably made out of a kitchen table or something like that, standing there and feeling like I am being held by something that is greater by me, by something that is loving me, by something that is giving me a sense of courage, by something that is telling me that even though everything around me is falling apart, nonetheless, life is worth living. Nonetheless, I am safe because God, our mother is there, protecting me, loving me and really guiding me towards what my life needs to become. And, you know, so that was an early impulse that I had as a child, which meant that, uh, that my vocation became more or less very clear. I needed to be a healing presence in the world. I needed to embody prayer and I needed, um, you know, uh, the, the, the fruit of that prayer was to be how I show up in the world. And there is this beautiful teaching from the Archbishop Desmond Tutu who said that we all need to be contemplatives. We all need to be able to go into the desert and experience, you know, the loving presence of God. But then once we do that, that experience, that power always sends us back into the world, into the midst of human suffering, so we can become partners in transfiguring the world. And so that was, of course, I didn't have those words, you know, I was a kid, but that was really a sense for me that that's what my life kind of needs to be. And of course, very soon after that, I also learned that saying yes to God and which had to mean saying no to injustice, that there are consequences for that. Yes. And, you know, a couple of those priests that I really admired were killed, including a priest in a parish where I was baptized, where I was a member as a child, you know, um, that guy was killed um, by the government. And so early on, I realized that this business of prayer is a dangerous business. Because if we are to fully embody what it means to pray, it also means that we have to follow that call to the very end. And that means that whatever we experience in prayer will kind of spit us out into the world and put us in conflict with, with our institutions, put us in conflict, you know, with some of the people that, uh, that we like or that we want to be admired uh, by. Uh, because again, saying yes to God means saying no to everything that violates God's love, God's justice, God's mercy in our midst. And so, you know, that was really for me a foundational experience of my life. Later on, I ended up in the United States, you know, in New York, coming here as an undocumented immigrant with my family. We were all looking for a better future for ourselves, you know. Uh, I went through a number of different experiences that were really kind of like initiations. I, and had personal crisis because of all the trauma from my childhood coming up. As a result, I ended up uh, at a Hindu monastery uh, in the US. As a result of that, you know, I discovered the teachings of Father Beat Griffiths, who I know 
you deeply, deeply love, who is really kind of your spiritual father um, in, 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 in many ways. And through that, you know, I ended up in India and I went to India thinking that I'm going to become some kind of a sadhu, some kind of a monastic who can finally merge with, you know, with God and, and spend my life in the Himalayas, you know, and on my way there I met a homeless child and that transformed everything for me. All of a sudden I was with this child, skin and bones, 13 year old girl, you know, hungry, uh, hurt. Uh, her face, cigarette burns, you know, all over her face. Uh, tourists were making porn films with her. And there she was holding my hand, asking me to buy her something to eat. How can you say, how can you not respond to that, you know? Uh, and so that then led me to... Uh, to this community where I where where I spent some time, a community called Seva Ashram. It was a Christian ashram located outside of Delhi in the slums, uh, and it was a community, a village of broken people, uh, people who have been rescued from the streets, people who have been you know who were dying of 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 AIDS, people who were brought into our ashram with maggots in their bodies, street kids who were abandoned and abused and brought to us. Um, and, you know, there's this image that I have when I think of that community every morning, the bell would ring and that meant it was time for prayer. And there was this procession of broken bodies moving towards our little chapel. Some of them were uh, crawling, some of them were uh, limping because you know, because they were, they couldn't walk properly. Some of them were jumping because they only had one leg. And even all the local dogs would come and join that procession and just move towards that little simple temple with Christ as our guru uh, in the center. And, you know, it was people of many different faiths, but everyone was moving there every morning, trusting that whatever is about to take place there that that can change something for them in their lives, that that can transform their suffering, that that can give them a sense of being loved, being seen, and that that could give them a new life, whether they get healed or not, you know? Um, and so that experience then of living there then really sharp shaped the second kind of stage of my journey, which was working with homeless youth on the streets in New York City, uh, co-founding an organization called the Reciprocity Foundation. And it's really at reciprocity where this ancient, I think, conflict between contemplation or prayer and action for me was healed. And, you know, I remember you accompanied me on that journey helping me to kind of integrate those, those two pieces as well as many other things. But I had this experience working with kids from the streets, you know, for the first few, few years of that work, I tried to show up as some kind of a counselor, someone who had learned things and who wanted to use the tools that I developed to essentially help people to fix their lives. After a couple of years, I realized that that was not really working, you know? So I remember having this insight that I need to show up for each of those kids, just as I was showing up for prayer. Um, oh. So basically I started showing up in this state of openness, receptivity, curious, not knowing, putting everything, all of the skills that I thought I had to the side and just simply being there, bearing witness to their pain, showing up without any buffers, accompanying them into the depths of their pain, oftentimes breaking with them. And then through that, I would always discover that as we went into that pain, into that heartbreak, as our bodies and souls were, you know, on the floor, shattered into pieces that then underneath that all, all of that there was this presence of God 
uh, ready to basically come into the situation if we could consent to it and welcome it and pick up all of those pieces, all of those broken parts of ourselves and turn them in, transform them into gifts. Um, and so for me, that's really what contemplation became about, you know, showing up before God, showing up for the world in this state of openness, trusting that underneath all of this, there's this impulse of God, that deep within our hearts, as St. Augustine says, there is a sleeping Christ. You know, he has this beautiful phrase, in the innermost cabin of your heart, there is a sleeping Christ. And so trusting that there is a sleeping Christ there and that our practices and all the things that we commit to, in a sense, wake that Christ up. And that then our goal is to consent to that presence, so that presence of love, that presence of forgiveness, that presence of justice can begin to live through us uh, as much as possible. And so that kind of way of prayer then for me reconciled contemplation and action, because contemplation is really about this openness, building courage and saying yes to that presence of Christ within us. And then action is us consenting and allowing God's action to move us into the world, to take everything that we have, transfigure it into something that can be useful and send it back into the midst of human suffering, send it back into the midst of our collapsing you know, economy, send it out into the world so we can be um, really, as the prayer of St. Francis says, uh, instruments of, of, of that power, instruments that, of that love. And, you know, that love sometimes is also, uh, you know, it's not just because I know sometimes when we talk about it, people think, oh, yes, it's all about being nice and this love, you know, showering the world. Saying yes to God sometimes means that we have to serve on the front lines. Sometimes that means that we have to get arrested. Uh, sometimes that means that we have to uh, go on long fasts. Uh, at this stage in our human journey, and especially for those of us who are committed to prayer, we really need to be invested in building this nonviolent spiritual special forces who could be sent into places where tremendous suffering is happening and show up as an expression of that radical love, uh, of that uncompromising uh, presence that is there to heal what's broken. Is this behind your desire to be a priest? You now are a priest. You left reciprocity and you chose, you made this tremendous choice. And I remember having hours of conversations, how you struggled with this choice and how eventually it was inescapable for you. And how you went to this decent but conservative seminary. And you used to ring me from the seminary and say, well, I'm loving this. I know the theology isn't my kind of thing. But what I love is the time to pray. What did you learn in that seminary about prayer that you hadn't learned before or hadn't integrated completely before? So, so you know, the, the thing about priesthood for me was that it was always there. That longing was always there present since my childhood. It manifested in different ways. Uh, of course, I had many difficulties with the church, you know, uh, <laughs> as anyone. As Jesus would. probably does himself, as we know, yes. Yeah. Yes. But I got to the point, you know, I, I remember I was visiting this I was invited to lead a retreat at this inner city church in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and Camden, New Jersey, for those of us, for those of uh, you who are not familiar, are it's really a war zone, you know. Oh, Camden poverty. is one of the most disastrous places in America, desperate. Yeah. yeah. If you want to see the ruins of the American dream, go to Camden, where Walt Whitman 
yeah. lived and died. It's yeah. such a paradox, this exactly. great visionary of real democracy and the ruins of every dream. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember, you know, going there to lead this retreat and in the midst of basically this collapsing town, uh, there was this church with an old Irish priest. Mm. And, you know, no one really knows about him except when Mother Teresa came to the U.S., that's where she wanted to pray. When Thich Nhat Hanh came to, uh, to the U.S., that's where he wanted to, to, to go to visit. There's this old Irish priest, very sweet, and he took me on a ride, or, you know, he showed me the house where, where Whitman lived, you know, and, and there he was, you know, just creating this free space where people could kind of go in and, and be renewed, you know? And, and of course that church didn't have many supporters who were able to contribute financially. So people would drive from three different states on Sunday to worship there, you know? And I led the retreat there, you know, it was very nice. But I remember that night just sitting and journaling and, and thinking, you know, unless I say yes to this, something in my heart that tells me that I need to be a priest, I'm going to miss something about what my life needs to be. And in many ways, it didn't make sense. I was very happy doing what I was doing. Um, at that point, I was traveling quite a bit, leading retreats, speaking, working with homeless youth. I really had a good and fulfilling life. It felt like I was doing what I'm meant to be doing. And then all of a sudden this thing came and I was like, no, I need to say yes to priesthood. And it just so happened that, you know, my, my, uh, my bishop who, who wanted, you know, who was kind of overseeing the process. Uh, he said, you know, when I look at your schedule, it seems quite busy. Uh, and so I have this one question, how much can we disturb your life? And I said, oh, I'm ready. And at that point, right before, you know, I was facing some serious health problems, it was just like, and I said, I'm ready. And so then he told me, he said, this is where I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you to this, to this place, you know? And I was like, no, 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 I'm ready, but not for that. That's the one place that, that I'm not willing to go to. And he said, you know. He was I, a shrewd guy, this one, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah. And, and he said, I have a strong sense, so why don't you go and visit? And, you know, it was a place known for being the most conservative seminary. Uh, it was run like a Benedictine monastery. It was in Wisconsin. Um, I knew that theologically, and even maybe when it comes to many social issues, it was a very different camp of the church than the one that I belonged to. But I went there for a visit and, you know, it didn't make sense, but I felt that this is exactly where I need to be. And so that's where I went for, uh, for three years, I left New York and just spent three years studying and in prayer. And it was a gift for me. Mm -hmm. And the gift was that I really discovered the Christian tradition in a new way. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of Right. I mean, you know, it was one of those places your clothes always smelled like incense, you know, you couldn't go into a chapel unless you were wearing your cassock. It was like entering a medieval uh, monastery with all these, you know, all the rites, you know, the daily, the divine office, you know, mm -hmm. the bell would ring, that's where you went, everyone worked together. And in many ways, it was like, a, you know, nine hour a day's engagement, like everything was scheduled everything was done in the community and so i was able to enter this ancient way of doing things and you know everyone would ask me like oh my god you get to pray so much what is the energy like you know all these people <laughs> yes. and I'm like you know it's a wrong question most of the days i struggle to get my butt to chapel uh, on time, the prayers that we're saying, you know, don't really give me much life. It's basically all repetition, all these kind of, you know, offices based on old monastic offices, the daily Eucharist, all of that, all the stuff, you know, the chanting and, 
And yet, after a few months, I discovered it's like, wow, this stuff is working on me. And I can't quite tell you how it's working on me, but all of a sudden, all conflicts, all things, all of that inside of me was simplifying. And there was just this sense of, I just need to show up when the bell rings and I need to say yes. And something, God is working on me in some way or form. And I have to trust that that will prepare me for what the next stage of my life will be. And, you know, so that was on a prayer level. On the other hand, there was also another gift that I've received there. I was studying and living in community and praying uh, and working together with people, many of whom probably disagreed with me on like 97% of the theology, social, and et cetera. And I saw it in myself how for most of my life, I never had to explain myself to anyone, you know, I was kind of running in progressive circles and et cetera. All of a sudden I was uh, living with people who have difficulties with women's ordination, who, who have, you know, who have- well, Homophobic, I remember you saying that and we were laughing about it. But, but you know, what I discovered is that there was this drive in me to like want to just dehumanize them so I could dismiss them. But as you like, spend so much time with people and as you study together you go through all these ancient texts because everything was based on ancient you know early church fathers basically how wonderful how wonderful those guys are so extraordinary yes. i evagrius of pontus diodicus of fortica i love john cassian Yes. My God, they are the real deal. Isaac of Nineveh. These yes. are glorious, glorious names. Yes. 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 So, you know, so you're having this experience of praying and all of a sudden, you know, you look at the guy who sits across from you in the chapel and it's not just, you know, some conservative dude. It's someone who like offered to cover my shift in the kitchen when I was sick last week. You know, and so all of a sudden I discovered that there was this love that this mutual love that emerged as we were going through this journey and we were able to move from talking about issues that that were very explosive to just meeting as friends and sharing with each other parts of our life stories and that included what we talked about things like you know, homosexuality, things like women's ordination, but all of it was held just with this tenderness that was not present before, you know? And that was a very important lesson for me. And what I learned is my views didn't change, but I changed. And I think the same happened to my friends. And do you feel that that tenderness that you're describing, that tenderness of sacred friendship, was built and sustained by secret prayer. That's one of the great gifts of prayer. Yes. And that's one of the gifts that the special forces of prayer could give in conflict situations. Yeah. After all, we're in this terrible conflict now in the States between the Democrats and the Republicans. Yeah. And many Democrats have a spiritual practice and many Republicans have a spiritual yeah. practice. Why can't prayer be used in a situation like this with holy intent to breed precisely that recognition of each other's humanity? How do you see these special forces of prayer working in conflict situations from your own experience? I mean, I think that what we need right now, and this is what we're trying to do in our community and here at the cathedral, and, and I think many people are trying to do that, and where is the cathedral? Tell us, because we would all like to come. The cathedral is in Garden City, New York. New Jersey. And it's part of a diocese that serves Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island. But, you know, I think that what we need to do right now is create spaces where people could be gathered, not based on their political or party affiliation, but rather we're... we're people can be gathered and where we have guides who are trained guides, who are people of prayer, who can take people on a journey. And that journey is we all need to 
come to terms with our heartbreaks. We all need to come to terms with, uh, with how broken we are. We need to uh, pick up all of those broken pieces of our lives and our world and then be guided how to bring all of that to God, how to talk to God about all of that, and then how to simply rest in God's presence, asking God to hold us so that love can begin to can begin to do the work of healing on us. How do you pray? How do you pray at this moment in your life as a priest with all kinds of responsibilities in a very poor district with people going through the horror of coronavirus, with America burning, with the world burning? How do you pray? I mean, this is this is what I what I just said is essentially this is what I do. You know, earlier in my life, I think when when I had an idealized idea about mysticism, uh, I was looking for methods that are very sophisticated. So, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, when I started when I started working with with homeless youth, uh, I met someone uh, who was this kind of a renegade uh, Hasidic rabbi, who. Uh, who worked with street kids. Um, and he gave me very simple instructions, you know, that come from his tradition. He said, when you pray, uh, talk to God, just as if you were talking to your best friend, tell the Holy One everything, especially dedicate special times each day when you tell God about all of your wor worries, all of your hurts, all of your problems, take off your mask and just speak. And then he said, if you do that, if you really let your whole essence speak to God like that, some days there will be a lot of tears, but that's a good thing. And when you're done talking to God about your hurts, when there is, where there are no more words to be said and you're completely spent just silently resting God, letting God hold you. And then for the rest of the day, practice joy and optimism, knowing that you are God's beloved child, knowing that you are loved and knowing that you are carrying a great gift in your heart, the gift that belongs to the world. So, Andrew, this is, this is how I pray. You know, I mean, oh, that's Jesus' instruction, isn't it? Yeah. Jesus didn't give complicated prayers and complicated practices. He gave one prayer and said, go into your inner room. Don't advertise that you're praying and talk to God directly because God's inside you. God's around you. You can speak to God and God is always listening to the voice of your heart. Exactly. <laughs> And so, you know, this is, this is how I pray. And so for me, silence and conversation, they are connected with each other in prayer, you know, and, and this is the same thing happens in relationships, you know, as months and years continue, you know, in, in, in one's relationship with someone else, we get to the point, uh, same with our prayer practice where perhaps we have to say less to each other, right? Where our very gestures speak to us more than words and where we can embody, uh, you know, this gospel mandate to pray always just by how we are present to each other. And that doesn't mean that we constantly are saying our prayers, but it's more like, you know, I always use the example of a mother who even when she's away from her child has somewhat of a physical sensation of, their, of her child's presence and all her words and actions in some way or form are done in relation to that child's well-being. So I think the same thing happens in prayer. You know, we start with a conversation and then eventually as the familiarity with God grows, maybe we say less and we just enjoy, you know, the silence, we enjoy each other's company and we rest in that. And then maybe there are times when, again, we need to speak, when we gather all of our hurts, all of the hurts of the people that we know, all of the hurts of our world, and simply stand before God, holding all of those hurts on our heart, you know, and asking God to do something about it. And so for me, you know, another thing that is very important in prayer is a big part of my vocation right now is praying for others. Oh, literally yes. bringing people into this space of God and holding them in front of God and asking God to please touch their lives with your love, you know? You and I have talked a great deal about 
the need to restore mystical prayer at the deepest level to the churches mm -hmm. and the need to teach so-called ordinary people just how simple and amazing and powerful it is. Yeah. And when you're talking, I remember when I was living in my log cabin in Arkansas, I was accompanying an old Russian woman in her dying process. And I used to say to her every time we had a conversation, I said, why are you paying me to accompany you? I should pay you because she was by far the most illumined and evolved and exuberant and tender and loving person I'd ever met. So basically I was asking her about her life and how she'd got through the madness of it. And she was giving me effortless, brilliant, simple instruction. But she did say once, let's do the Jesus prayer together. Mm -hmm. And I have a great passion for the Jesus prayer because as you know, Father Bede really grounded his entire magnificent being in that prayer. And when I was with him as he was dying, fighting this terrifying mm -hmm. heart attack and all the agony that he went through, and he was constantly, 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 constantly returning to the Jesus prayer and he often would say to me this is all you need this is all you need mm -hmm. so I told her that story and we started to pray the Jesus prayer Lord Jesus Christ have mercy upon me a sinner and suddenly she said are you smelling it I said yes my cabin in Arkansas and her little place in wherever she was, New Jersey, was filled with this divine incense. Yeah. And we both started sobbing. Yeah. Because it's at those kinds of moments that you realize that there really, it, there really is a presence that will reach you. Yeah. Yeah. And the second thing that I just wanted to share with you because I have such a great devotion to the Virgin and I know you do too. The, we talk so deeply about the Black Madonna and Chestakova being at the core of the whole movement you were describing. The Black Madonna was the banner under which Solidarność walked and struggled. Can you see? Yes, yes, yes. And I just wanted to tell you something I think I have told you before, but when I went through my own really devastating dark night experience in which my life was threatened, and um, mm -hmm. Eric and I, my husband and I lived through real horror on every level. The only thing that helped us survive was the rosary. Yeah. And it was in those years that I discovered just what prayer can be. Yeah. Because I was too shattered to meditate. I was too outraged to do any sophisticated practices. But I remember Jesus in Gethsemane just saying, not my will, but your will. Mm -hmm. And because the Virgin had revealed herself in miraculous ways to us, flooding our house with the smell of rose, her icons weeping, and I knew she was protecting us. All I could do for months on end was simply say the rosary. And I know that that is why I am here now. Mm -hmm. And I know that one of the deepest reasons for the dark night process that we're all going through is to really, in a sense, compel us to discover this naked intimacy with God by whatever, we, in whatever way we worship God, it really doesn't matter. And then so that God can reveal just how passionately in love he, she, it is with us so that we can have a direct mystical experience. And once that has happened, you know how to pray ceaselessly yeah. because it's just a question of incessant remembrance, turning back, aligning your whole nature with the true north of that sacred communion, that non-dual communion. And once you've experienced this power of prayer, and I know you have, and you exemplify it in so many ways for me and for so many other people, once you've experienced that, you want to give it to everyone. 
so that everyone can know that they are never alone. There is no place where they are alone. I remember meeting in Nepal when I was 28, this absolutely radiant and beautiful Iranian Christian. And he had been tortured horribly. And he said the only thing that enabled him not only to stay sane, but to be able to see his torturers as human beings and to forgive them was the Lord's prayer. That's all he could do because he was so broken and tormented, but he clung to the Lord's prayer like a raft. You cling to a raft, it's a burning. And he said the most extraordinary thing happened because in one of the torture sessions, all he could do was to say the Lord's prayer inside himself and he was gazing into the eyes of his torturer and saw that those eyes were filled with tears Mm -hmm. because there was something in that man that recognized that this man that he was doing these appalling things to was a good man and his innate goodness came out and they became friends Mm -hmm. and he forgave him and that man helped him escape wow yeah wow yeah Yeah. I don't know if you know the work of Walter Sisek, the great Catholic priest who yeah. was in. Yeah. There's a story in there when he's, he's seen, he lived for 30 years in a wretched, devastatingly cruel concentration camp in Siberia. And there's a story in there when three old guys who've been in that place forever, really broken down, come to him and on Good Friday and say, we have to have an Easter celebration. We have to find somewhere. So they go into a latrine. The three of them, that, that's one place they can't be beaten. Or, or, and in this stinking latrine, they say the prayers of Easter and the latrine starts to radiate divine light. And then when Walter Sisek was eventually rescued in a series of extraordinary ways from Russia, Before he left Russia, got up to go into the plane, he just knelt and kissed the ground of Russia and blessed Russia for all the agony that he'd been through because Russia had taught him what prayer really is. So these are the stories. They're not stories. This is fact. And as we are going into this absolutely devastating period in which the entire world is going to be shaken in ways that most people don't even dare to imagine, but you know and I know, it's so important that people find in their own unique way this relationship. And that's why I'm doing this 40 days and 40 nights journey at this moment, this prayer journey, because I am so hungry in the depths of my being for everybody who wants it to have this relationship because I know that it means literally at times the difference between dying and living the desire to live and the desire to die I have been there and I know that everyone is going there and I want them to have the living one with them and to know that the living one lives in them. Yeah. And to know, as you said so beautifully, that they are the beloved of the beloved. Yeah. Whatever happens, if you know that, there is a good chance that you can stay vibrant and calm and spacious yeah. and loving even your enemies and constantly trying to find skillful ways of reaching and pouring out. Yeah. And no one knows if we're going to get through this But one thing we can be dead sure of is that one way of staying in the stream of grace that is supremely powerful, perhaps the most powerful way and the most naked way, the most intimate way, is prayer. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're mentioning here these 
beautiful gifts that we have, these simple gifts like Jesus. Simple, simple, rosary. simple. Because I think that there's this sense, you know, uh, sometimes I meet people in different retreat centers who are kind of on a journey of finding the next best thing, you know, like the new spiritual teacher in town, the new this or that. And the truth is kind of, I mean, what you really said in your book, The Direct Path, all we need is just one simple practice that takes us into the heart of God. And we don't really need much more than that to begin this journey, you know? And yes, there is a way. Well, it, it is more than that. To entertain yourself with various practice is a form of advanced spiritual narcissism. Yeah. It's just a game. Yeah. If Kabir gives only one practice as the greatest universal mystic with Rumi we've ever had, saying the name of God, mm -hmm. if Jesus gives just one prayer, if hundreds of thousands of anonymous monks in the Greek and Russian Orthodox Church have achieved Christhood through just sitting and doing the Jesus prayer, isn't it a time to say to people, stop your smorgasbording, get down to a naked, simple practice that you really love and have the guts to let it bore the hell out of you so that that boredom itself can dissolve your ego and so that through the gate that that boredom opens you can enter into the truth of who you are yeah. that's one of the most important teachings of the the desert fathers they don't say oh if you pray the jesus prayer you will immediately get enlightenment especially if you come to my classes and my retreats on it they say it's a it's little bore the death out of you but it'll bore your ego to death and that's one of the reasons why this a simple practice is so powerful because you can't play with it you have to return to it i've been initiated into multiple mystical traditions and i know because through grace hundreds of practices but at this time in my life there is only one practice and that's the name of god for me the prayer to the of the name of god everything else has gone away because in that simple practice i remain always on my knees i don't entertain myself i don't say oh let's have a, a, a buddhist practice today maybe no no maybe i'll have an islamic practice or maybe i will do some smudging all of that has gone by the board for me it's now mm -hmm literally a matter of life and death to stay in remembrance and the quickest way is through the name of god all the short prayers that i've put into this journey because as cassian says john cassian fourth century one of our guys he said oh don't if you're gonna have to don't if you don't want to do the jesus prayer all the time do short prayers yeah. they will concentrate your being yeah and as you know, this journey that I prepared, Adam, and I hope that you'll look at it and help others to come to it because it's really took a long time. I did this book, Light the Flame, in which I really created as a universal mystical Bible, drawing on all the traditions as a prayer for the new universal mysticism. But I wanted this particular journey to be over Lent, to prepare people for mm -hmm. Easter, mm -hmm. not in a specifically Christian way, but in an archetypal way, yeah. the emergence from the winter of our discontent into the outrageous radiance and possibility of spring. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could just end our time together talking about what Lent is for you as a Christian mystic, what this period before Easter means in the universal sense for people? What is it that Lent is in the deepest way for you? You know, for me, Lent is quite simple, uh, actually. Uh, it's really, you know, one of, one of the guides that, that, that has been very important for me is this, I don't know if you're familiar with the teachings of Catherine Doherty, she was a Russian, yes. Russian uh, kind of very, you know, wild. Very extravagant lady, yes. Very 
I immediately identified with her. I love her. She's tremendous. But those Russian nuns, my God, if you've ever met them, don't mess with them. You'll end up in a cement kimono. Yeah. They're tough and amazing. Yeah. But, you know, she has this thing that was very instructive for me. She said that uh, whenever you have a big question in your life, because eventually she sold everything, moved into the slums in Toronto and became this kind of very similar to Dorothy Day, but very in touch with the Eastern kind of contemplative. Uh, more joyful in a way than Dorothy, yeah. because there's a, there's a mystic ecstasy in her, which is just so contagious. Yes. She was one happy camper, despite the horror of what was surrounding her. Yes. And so she has this thing, she says, you know, whenever you have a big question in your life, just go into Pustynia, which is the Russian and Polish word for the desert, which she meant a little cabin, right. and sit there, you know, fasting on bread and water and waiting for what she calls the, the word of God to come. The hidden word of God, which is said to Job in the, the word that transfigures him, which cannot be put in any language, yes. Yeah, so, you know, so for me, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of theological things about Lent and, and, and Easter. For me, uh, Lent is really a time for me to go into the desert, to fast, to simplify, and to wait for that new infusion of God that we receive, you know, archetypally during Easter that can take all of my crap and transfigure it into something that could be an offering for the world. Uh, so it's a time and, of quiet emptying yeah. so that you can be filled again yeah. with the Holy Spirit, the Shakti, yeah. the vibrant love energy that explodes in the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. In that, spring. Yes. That's, that's it, you know. So it's very simple, but, but it works. I think that we don't need to go more complicated than that, you know. If someone comes to you as they've come to me thousands of times and says to you, how do you pray? How do I pray? And tells you that they've never been able to pray. What would you say to them? I mean, I think a lot of people- what do you say to them as a priest? You know, a lot of people, especially as youth and young people who come to me, uh, prayer is a difficulty for them because they they have difficulties believing in any kind of presence, you know, in any kind of uh, God. And very often they're refugees from fanatical Christianity too. Exactly. They've been degraded. So many of your homeless kids were gay kids who'd been abandoned by their parents. Exactly. And so, you know, my, so, so my, I, I mean, my teaching again is very simple, you know, uh, and that is, uh, imagine that there is a chair in front of you or put an empty chair before you. Imagine that in that chair, uh, there is an imaginary friend sitting there. And, and that imag imaginary friend is capable of loving you in a way that you've never been loved before. And so start by paying attention to what's present in you. Uh, all the pain, but also all the joy located in your body. And then imagine that all of that is coming into your heart. Put the two palms of your hands on your heart and hold all of those bits and pieces of your life just as if you were holding a little baby with that kind of tenderness and love. And then whenever you're ready, start talking to this imaginary friend about what is happening and then ask that imaginary friend to come towards you and hold you and just rest in that simply resting in silence and opening your, your whole being to the love that is poured into you, imagining that your whole being is like a sponge and that you're absorbing this luminosity of love into your being, saying yes to it. So that's how I start people, you know? And in my experience, it's amazing. That's that how you end too, isn't it? It is just like that, isn't it? And you know what keeps on happening? They start talking to this imaginary friend and then they literally start feeling that the room, it just becomes filled with this presence that something that they've never, you know, experienced before, but this presence is not neutral. It's something that is not a person in a way that you and I are a person, but it's something that loves them, uh, you know? 
What a wonderful, wonderful way of putting it. Would you end our time together by praying for everyone who might take this journey and who are blessed by your instruction? Because I would love your blessing on this journey for all of us. Yeah, yeah, of course. So let's just uh, maybe close our eyes for a moment. If you like, you can uh, bow your, um, your head a little bit, opening your heart to God. And I wanted to use a prayer here that, uh, that I would like everyone to repeat after me. It's a prayer that Mother Teresa prayed daily. Uh, and this prayer is very dear to me. And again, it's very simple, but I believe that this prayer can take us into that space of consent and availability uh, so we can be used by God. So let us begin. Do you need my hands, Lord, to help the sick and the poor who need help today? Lord, I give you my hands. Do you need my feet, Lord, to carry me today to those who need a friend? Lord, Lord I give you my, give feet. my feet today. Do you need my voice, Lord, that I may speak the work of love to those who need it today? Lord, I give you my voice. Do give you need my, my heart, Lord, so that I may love each person today without exception? Lord, I give you my heart today. And now in conclusion, I would like to ask God to infuse every single person who is listening to this message with God's loving care, infusing them with that power that is able to touch all the dark corners of our hearts all of our wounds, all of our brokenness, and transfigure them into something that could become our unique gift that we could offer the world. So this way, our lives can be, become useful. So this way, we can know that nothing is wasted. And so this way, we may be sent by God into the midst of human suffering to be God's, God's partners of tr in transfiguring this world. And so we ask this in the name of God, who is love. Amen. Om Namah Kristaya. Uh, I love you. Love I'm you so happy we had this conversation. Yeah, yeah, thank you for- uh, I miss you. Yeah, I, miss I love you so much and our conversations have always been so nourishing to my soul as I know it. you have nourished so many souls now. Yeah, thank same you. Here, you know, same here. Oh. Thank you for this gift of, of togetherness that, and, and, and this gift of friendships that, friendship that we've enjoyed for so many years now. Um, I think of you often and, and I know you do too. Isn't Perhaps the last thing we would say to each other in the sense that our friendship is such a precious thing to us both, but it is a friendship born out of prayer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Born out of sharing the mysteries that we have been graced to, to receive in a state of love. What more extraordinary experience on the earth is there than friendship like that? Yeah. Thank you for having been always there. And thank yeah. you for the wild, grueling, difficult, wonderful work that you continue to do. And thank you for looking so well and so happy in it to, to show people that this is not a path of misery, but a path of abundant peace and calm and energy and joy. As you, as you said many times before, joy is the power. Joy is the power. <laughs> I love you.